Hi there, welcome once again to the Duke Scopy TV studio. I'm Ben Jones and alongside me today to discuss investment in Vietnam is Kevin Snowball. Kevin, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. So if we can begin by discussing your organisation, uh, your personal involvement, and can you just give us a bit of background information for investment in Vietnam? Mm -hmm, of course. Um, well, PXP Vietnam Asset Management, which you see the logo for here, is the management company of um, PXP Vietnam Fund and PXP Vietnam Emerging Equity Fund, plus a segregated uh, mandate for a European institution. Um, we manage in total about $160 million um, purely for focused on Vietnam listed equities, or, or almost entirely focused on Vietnam listed equities. Um, I'm the founder. Um, I moved to Vietnam in August 2000 to set up what became PXP Vietnam Asset Management. Uh, we started uh, managing PXP Vietnam Fund on the 31st of December 2003, so we're sort of 10 and a half years, or just over 10 and a half years into managing uh, money in Vietnam. And um, given that the um, Vietnam Stock Exchange has only existed since July 2000, we're um, only two and a half years behind it, essentially. Um, in terms of investing in Vietnam, um, when we started, um, Vietnam had one stock market, it had 22 listed companies, the total market capitalization was $160 million um, and average daily turnover was approximately $75,000 a day. So you know, go forward 10 and a half years, there are two markets, um, total of about 720 uh, listed companies, total market cap of about $50 billion, um, an average daily turnover anything between 75 million and uh, a couple of hundred million on a very good day. Um, so it's been an interesting journey, um, still really only at the very beginning of it, um, and we're you know, looking forward to the next five years, I guess. Okay, great. Now, in uh, 2011, monetary policy quite significantly changed to more aiming for more longer, more substantial growth. Yeah. Can you elaborate on this policy and how it's affected uh, Vietnamese investment? Sure. Well, um, basically, the government for 15 to 20 years had a, a very simple and straightforward monetary policy, which was growth above everything. So all the all the planks in the platform, if you like, were designed to um, ensure that Vietnam grew at around 7% or the GDP grew at around 7% plus. Um, per year, but that caused um, increasingly it was um, causing mini boom bust cycles where inflation in 2008 at 28% uh, and 2011 23%. So that as the cycles were getting shorter, so the government felt that it was time to do something to achieve more sustainable um, long term development of the economy. Um, and so they introduced a, a platform which aimed to achieve that, and initially through high interest rates, but also um, by um, restraining credit growth, which obviously is, has a, an inflationary impact. And that's had a very good Im in effect. And as Vietnam has started to move up the value chain in terms of its manufacturing or its production, um, so the, the control that the government has, has exercised the economy has helped that process. So now we've seen, infl we've seen inflation now at, at just below 5% on an annualized basis. We've moved from um, trade deficit to trade surplus a couple of years before um, anybody expected us to. And the currency, which had been extremely weak, is partly as a result of those two pressures, um, has for the last two and a half years or so been um, the most stable currency in Asia. So, you know, they've made some significant ach achievements. And since um, certainly 2012, the market started to um, notice that the, the improvements were coming through. The, the index was up 19% in 2012. It was then up 21% um, uh, last year and uh, somewhere around 15, 16% year to date. So um, we've had, we're in our third year of a bull market, essentially. Um, so it all, all feels pretty good um, going forward as well. Definitely. Uh, could you discuss the potential uh, pitfalls and benefits for both ETFs and alternative investment? What do you think is the better option? Um, well, obviously, I'm going to be slightly biased um, in favour of the funds that we manage. Um, the problem with the ETFs is not entirely due to their own making, but uh, because Vietnam has um, foreign ownership limits, and so it's 49% for in, in the listed market, 49% for everything except um, banks and 30% for banks. Now, we expect those limits to be relaxed at some point, um, hopefully quite soon before um, the situation becomes worse, because the, the longer it goes on, the more companies that get to the foreign ownership limits 
implement, the more difficult it becomes to trade Vietnam as a whole. Um, now, the ETFs are restricted in what they can own because they can't own stocks at the foreign ownership limit because they're, they're in, basically they are baskets of investable stocks and stocks at the foreign ownership limits are, are by definition non-investable by foreigners or at least not without some difficulties. Um, and so, you know, the uh, performance of the ETFs um, has been pretty awful. Um, and if you look at, for example, over the last um, five years against Vietnam Emerging Equity Fund, just as one of our products, which is not the best performer, but um, you know, the Vietnam Emerging Equity Fund over the last five years is up somewhere around 36, 37%. Um, and over the same period, the, the DBX tracker, um, which is based on the FTSE Vietnam Investable Index, um, is down about 39%. So there is a, a huge diversity which, um, in performance, which comes from the restrictions in access, essentially. So um, we think where, uh, where you're able to, then, then having broader access to the market, and, and there will soon um, be an onshore ETF which will not be, we're told, will not be subject to the um, foreign ownership limit. So that may um, reduce the attractiveness of those um, offshore ETFs and if they start contracting in size then they have to sell stock and so the stocks that they own will be under pressure and the performance will continue to be pretty appalling. Um, so yeah, I mean we would suggest that um, if you're able to um, open an account in Vietnam, which is a fairly difficult process. It c can take for institutions between three and six months and occasionally even longer um, to get a trading code, which you need to be able to, um, to, to buy uh, listed equities in Vietnam. Um, or um, obviously, from our perspective, the, the, the much better idea is to come through a fund. Now, obviously, we're, we're a foreign investor, but because we've been there as long as we have, we've owned all the stocks that have got to the foreign ownership limit before they got there. Um, and we're we're a you know we're a very long term manager. Our portfolio turnover rate is less than twenty percent a year, and we tend you know what we've tried to do is to uh, build baskets or, or portfolios of the highest quality stocks available in Vietnam for the long term. And you know hopefully so far, um, given our relative performance against the index, that's been proven to be not um, too idiotic an idea. Of course. Now, um, Vietnam has obviously been in the news quite a lot recently because of its dispute with China and then the subsequent protests. How has this affected your approach and what's the situation like now? Um, well, in terms of the protests, it was pretty much a one uh, possibly two day thing. It was very unusual that the government allowed protests um, against China. Um, they got somewhat out of control and um, and then the government you know came to step back in and took control and decided that the, you know the, the long term impacts of um, you know the the issues that were happening in the industrial parks with some factories being burnt down and so on um, would be very uh, negative for Vietnam. Um, Vietnam is to a large extent um, dependent on China for its trade so for example um, Vietnam's second uh, largest export but in terms of value is, is garments and footwear and a lot of the textiles are imported from China. Now they could replace that imp those imports from India and Korea for example. Um, it's you know somewhat higher cost um, but more particularly over the last two or three years a new um, type of um, production has um, come from essentially come from nowhere so Vietnam in 2012 uh, assembled roughly 24 percent of Samsung Samsung's global smartphone production um, and um, that increased last year and Samsung continue to um, invest in the country and as they come in and as they you know last year were 16 percent of Vietnam's total exports as they start to increase their um, production as they start to increase their investment so associated industries spring up around it so as as um, other electronics manufacturers see that Vietnam is uh, able to produce um, uh, their their products efficiently and in, this includes Intel and Foxconn and um, people of that nature um, then we see more investment inflows but it or uh, FDI foreign direct investment but if it's perceived that Vietnam has a problem because of uh, unrest in industrial parks um, or, or in the country in general um, then that will have a damaging effect and now all of the components that go into smartphones are made in China um, and until Vietnam is able to manufacture those components itself it is it's very dependent on China and if you know 16% of its exports suddenly disappear because it's having a dispute with China then GDP 
GDP will contract. Um, and the Vietnamese are very pragmatic, and I think they, you know, they very quickly realised that this was giving them, um, starting to give them a slightly um, negative um, press outside of Vietnam. And so, um, you know, since um, you know the the beginning of May, it's been really relatively calm. And the the, the the Vietnam index came down, you know, having peaked in March at about 609 came all the way back down to 509 and you know two days ago it was back above 600 and a couple you know um, China has apparently been having some um, live firing drills in the, the Eastern Sea or as the Chinese call it the South China Sea as everybody else calls it the South China Sea um, and that's obviously created a little bit of nervousness but I um, I think that um, you know uh, over the next few days that will that will calm down it's you know so the index has come down from just above 600 to just below 590 on that um, and we'll see where we go from here. But I, you know, I think um, given that the, the micro um, is as strong as it is, and given that the performance of companies and the development of the econ economy as GDP, GDP growth is starting to pick up again, um, I think we'll see that um, you know, confidence returns fairly quickly. Kevin, once again, thank you very much for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Do make sure you keep clicking back to Duke Scopy TV for plenty more updates and exclusive interviews. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.